I want to, uh, we're actually going to do a slightly different example than I thought. We're not going to do the quiz several different ways. We're going to do another example. Um, I forgot what examples I already had out there. But before that, I want to spend a minute talking about the manner in which the client and server communicate. Because I've gotten a couple of questions, uh, actually I've gotten several questions, that if you read between the line, read between the lines, it shows that there's a little bit of shakiness in exactly how the client and server communicate. All right. Um, so I want to address that and, and talk about that first off. Because I've heard people say, you know, like, you know, how can I get JavaScript to know this? How can I get the server-side code to know this? Keep in mind, the communication between the client and server is very limited. And it's not a conversation, all right? It is more like sending a voicemail and then responding with a voicemail. Because there's really only two chances that the client and server have to communicate. The client communicates with the server in the form of the request. The server communicates with the client in form of a response. Now this is true, by the way, whether you're talking about the traditional interaction between client and server or an AJAX interaction. It's the same thing. In both cases, the client makes a request, the server responds to it. And that's the only communication that happens between them. So, in a traditional model, in a traditional model, the client makes a request for some page. All right. Let, let's talk about the tuition chart, for example. The client makes a request for the tuition chart and maybe passes some parameters. In this case, it doesn't need to uh, in this example, but it could in other, other contexts. That's how the client sends stuff to the server, through the request. That's the request. That's the only thing, that's the only way the client can say something to the server. The server then responds back with a completed HTML page, which is a result of all its server-side scripting. That's the only way that the server sends stuff back to the client, is that request. So in a traditional model, this is an HTTP request, and this is a completed web page. Now an AJAX interaction really is no different, all right, except we add on to this, in addition to the HTTP request, Let's talk about, say, your tuition um, calculator, your AJAX tuition calculator. All right. You you, your initial request is an HTTP request for that form. So AJAX calc, we'll call it, dot HTML or PHP. All right. That goes and a completed web page is returned. So an HTTP request is made, a completed HTML documents returned. Now, as far as the AJAX part of this, all right, the client is also going to make a request to, I'm going to change this from AJAX calc to, to form calc, because this is really just the form that you're requesting. The AJAX calc will be called, and I'll pass the parameters, hours equal 12, residency equals in county, for example. That's the only way the client can send information to the server. It's the only chance the client has in this transaction to give something to the server. After that, forget about it. The server can't look at the value of a, of a text box or a drop down or a radio button or anything like that, right? The only thing it's going to get is that URL from the client. And specifically, when we're talking about this, of interest of us, in addition to the URL, are the values on the query string. So if the 
server needs anything from the client, it has to be passed as part of the query string when you make that request. And again, that's true both in traditional mode and in, in Ajax mode. All right. Now, the server is going to return back a piece of data that could be formatted any number of ways, XML, JSON, delimited data. All right. Everything that the server is going to return back to the client needs to be part of that data because the server doesn't get any other chance to send some data back to the, the, the client. So whatever the, the client needs from the server needs to be part of that piece of data that it sends back. So that's the only two ways that this communicates. Other than that, forget about it. You can't write code on your JavaScript to access a variable that lives on the server. All right. You can't write code in your PHP to access the value of a form control. The only thing you can do is you can pass it to the server via the query string and you can return values to the client. That's the only way they communicate. One way that, one reason that that might be a little fuzzy could be because when you're in development mode, the client and server are the same machine. So it almost looks like you're running one big program that, you know, is connected. It's not really connected. Remember, the server could be another machine. The server could be, you know, a, a web server in, in Rio de Janeiro, all right? And my client is, is here, you know, in Illyria. Isn't it a different program, actually, that you're running? Well, it is. It is. But what I'm, what I'm telling you is that's only because we're in development mode here. That, yeah, as you're developing, your client and web server is the same machine. So you're running the browser, that's the client on your machine. You're running web server software, that's the, the web server on your machine. But I'm saying that's not even the typical case. The typical case is your client is running a browser, the web server is who knows where running web server software. All right? And the only way those two mix or communicate is a request is sent, a response is, is sent back. That's the only way that they could do that. So in terms of um, our example, let's look at our example from last time, if I can find it. All right, in terms of our example from last time, let's go here. This is the multi-quiz. When I make the request here, whoa. When I make this request here, that's the only thing that the client's going to send to the server. We better give it everything because that's all it's getting from the client. All right? So what am I doing here in this case with the quiz? I'm looping through and I'm, I'm concatenating those answers onto the end of the query string. And then I'm making the request. But that's the only way I can get data from the client to the server. All right. If it's not part of that, the server doesn't know about it. All right. Likewise, the only way the, the, the server can get data back to the client is inside the code, there's going to be some print statements. That print, that send the, you know, think of print as being send this piece of data to the client. All right. And that piece of data gets sent back to the client. So the accumulation of all the print statements gets sent back to the client and ends up in this variable here, HTTP response text. So that is the accumulation of all the prints that your, one second, uh, that, that your uh, server-side code makes. That's the accumulation of all of them. Yes. Well, st strictly speaking, this is an object, HTTP is an object, and this would be an attribute of that object, and I guess you could call it a string object, but, you know, 
variable string object. All a variable is is a pointer to something, right? A variable can be a pointer to an object or it can be a pointer to uh, a, a, what, what typically is called a primitive variable. Something like an integer or a boolean that, that really isn't. Um, there really isn't, you know, anything beyond that. But I guess strictly speaking, this is a XML HTTP re, uh, TP object. This is a string object associated with that, and then I call a function on that. But yeah, that's what I mean. This variable again is a pointer to that object. All right, so let's keep that in mind as we're doing it. You have to send everything as part of the request. You have to send everything back. Other than that, those two don't communicate. Again, it's not like a conversation. It's more like exchanging voicemails. The client has one chance to send all the information it needs to the server. The server has one chance as part of this request to, to send back an answer. And again, as I said before, this is the same in traditional mode as it is in AJAX mode. The difference being that uh, what the, the, the kind of request that's made from the client to the server and the kind of response that gets sent back. In traditional mode, the client makes an HTTP request and gets back a completed web page and the web page is redisplayed. In AJAX mode, the um, client makes an XML HTTP request and the response comes back as just a piece of data in some format that the client has to take and, and update the page with. All right, here's the example that we're going to go over and we'll go over several versions of this example. One thing to keep in mind with this as we go over this example. This example is still a relatively simple example. So the XML version of this example probably doesn't really show off the advantages of XML. All right. In other words, if you were looking at this, you might say, gee, the the, the, the limited version seems a lot simpler. All right, so why would I do this with XML? Well, the delimited version uh, seems simpler because I'm returning back just one kind of data from this, homogeneous data, and therefore, yeah, it's right up delimited data's alley. All right, um, but again, if, if we were to throw a massive XML one for you, it would be very confusing. So we're going to start off with a simple XML one. And so even though it doesn't necessarily show all the advantages of uh, XML and show all the power of XML, it's a good starting point. And one thing about this, by the way, um, and I mentioned any of the code that I create on the Mac can sometimes be a little problematic to open. Not terribly difficult, but a couple little things you have to do. I'm going to go and open up a Windows Explorer and I'm going to clear all this stuff out because we have it from before. All right, I'm going to open the zip file. Notice there are these sort of like extra files that I didn't see when I created on the Mac. So these are kind of like ghost files that, that, the, that the Mac sees, that, that, or that the PC sees, that exist on the Mac, but you don't really see them. So you don't really need to, and there's one of them per uh, directory. You don't need the ones that are not, aren't folders, so don't extract those. And in fact, in this case, if I look inside that folder, there's a delimited, a JSON, and an XML folder. And again, then there's their associated sort of ghost files. So as far as that goes, I just take the folders when I extract it, not the ghost files. If you take the ghost files, sometimes when you extract it, you get a goofy error saying that that file already exists or something because those files seem to have the same name. One's a file though and one's a directory. The other thing is, again, I'll go delete that guy. The other thing, again, is it's good to open them up in WordPad 
and save them. Then you can open them up in Notepad. Oops. If you don't do that first, then your uh, carriage returns look goofy in it. So it's a small cost to pay. All right, let me run this. And let's take a look at the behavior of this. Now, this is the exact same functionality done three different ways, done in XML, delimited data, and uh, JSON data. So let's go in here, and let's first look at the simplest one, which will be the delimited data. And my form to get started here is called dictionary.html. All right. It would be called that if I had started the web server. So let's go and start the web server. Start all services. There we go. All right, what this is, is this is a simple little translation utility for mathematical terms. The way it works is like this. You type in one character at a time a mathematical term. All right, as you type in, this text box, which again, I could have did a little more styling this because that text box looks, or, or uh, drop down looks kind of uh, goofy. But this is going to be populated with um, all the terms, all the mathematical terms that match what I've typed in. I can then pick one, click go, and it will give me it translated into Spanish. So, for example, let's type in M, U, and all right, I see multiplication. That's what I want. So I click that and click go and it gives me a translation. Or I can type in A, B, and again, as I type it in, it narrows it down. All right, absolute value, translation is that. All right, let me ask you a question. Someone describe what's going on behind the scenes here. How many Ajax requests do I have going on this page? Two. Why do you say two? One for, the one for the character typing and one for the button, right? I can tell that because, first of all, how do I know that there's Ajax at all? I know that because it's not rewriting the page, right? As I type something in, that drop down changes. You have to take my word for it that it's getting those values from the server. We'll see that in a minute, but Indeed, it's getting those, those, those letters, those words rather, that match the letters we've typed in from the server. So I'm forming that. That is request one. All right. As I then go in and click go, that's request two. So there's actually two different kinds of requests that, that I have. So I actually, I kind of have uh, two server-side scripts. I guess I could have written it as one, but I didn't, all right? I wrote two simple server-side scripts as opposed to one complicated one, all right? So, um, one of them takes the letters that I've typed in and returns back a list of mathematical terms that match that. One takes the mathematical term that I've selected in the drop-down and returns to me the Spanish translation. Now, um, in this particular case, because we don't really get into database interactivity, uh, this is all done with, with a set of hard-coded arrays, with, with a hard-coded array, or actually a set of hard-coded arrays. But you could uh, easily see, if you wanted to generalize this more, that this could actually um, be pulling from a database of mathematical terms if you want to make this more involved. Um, 
depending on time, you know, maybe that's something we'll look at towards the towards the end of class to actually pull the the, the values from the database as opposed to uh, pulling them from our hard coded arrays. Really, uh, you know, there'll be a little difference in how we do it, uh, a little difference on the server side, but most of it would remain the same. Okay. What event am I dealing with on the text box? On change? No. On key up, right. Why do I know it's not on change? Let's do some reverse engineering here. Because I didn't leave the field, so it's not on key change. Why do I know it's on key up as opposed to on key down? Well, I know it because I know it, all right? The real reason, though, is if you trap it when you press the key, you're actually sort of like one character behind. In other words, only when you lift up the key does it truly, is it truly in the buffer, and then it can be recognized as that. So, I, as I don't want to do that, but trust me, it's not when I hit the key, it's when I release the key. All right. Now, what event actually triggers the translation? The on click, right. Okay. Let's look at the let's look at the delimited version of this. Now, what pieces of this do you think are going to be the most different? What pieces of a client, let's put it this way, are going to be the most different from the quiz? Creating the object going to be any different? No, nope. the only difference I'm going to make two of them, right? One for each request. So, so slightly different, not anything major. Is is making my request going to be any different in this one compared to the quiz that we did last time? Me formatting and making the request is that going to be different? Yeah, I say it'll be a little different, right? We're not calling the quiz grading script. We're calling the script to give me a list of words. All right, so we're calling a different script, and we're passing it different things. We're not we're not sending it my answers. We're sending it the value of the text box. So making the request is going to be a little bit different, but not drastically different. It shouldn't be earth shattering. Now, the PHP code is going to be, of course, totally different, right? Because we're doing a totally different thing. We're not, we're not returning uh, whether they got a question right or wrong and, and the right answer to it. We're returning um, a list of words that match a string, all right? Finally, the formatting of the output, is that going to be different? Yeah, that's going to be a lot different, right? Because in... The, in the case of the quiz, we were popping up whether they got it right or wrong. We were popping up their cre answer, uh, the correct answer. Here, we're popping up a, a dropdown. We're actually creating the HTML for a dropdown that gets populated. So yeah, how we format the output is going to be a lot different. So really, and this will be a characteristic uh, of Ajax. You know, what changes is the script that you have on the server side and how you're formatting the output. That is the communication. Making the request, getting the response, all right, um, and, and the PHP code that processes it. Making the request is actually pretty straightforward. That will only change a little bit. The other two things change a lot. All right, let's look first at the client. All right, as we're looking along. Make two request objects, right? One for giving the list of mathematical words that match the string. One for giving me the Spanish translation. I probably should pick a better name than HTTP for them. I should explicitly call them, you know, get math terms, get translation. And that might be better uh, than HTTP and HTTP2. Or at the very least, I could put a comment in there that said that. All right. My 
function to create a request object is the same, right? Still doing the browser sniffing, still telling which, uh, which browser I'm on, and making the object the appropriate manner. Only difference is I'm calling it twice, so I get two of them. All right? Now, my function get words. All right? What do you think calls this function get words? Yeah, the key up. If we look here on the form, on key up equals get words, and I'm passing it this dot value. Well, what is this dot value? This refers to the object, the control that the script is on. So it's giving me the value of that text box. So that's what this dot value means. All right. So I'm passing it the value of the text box. I'm making my request. I'm setting my state change for this request, and then I'm making the actual request. So, the bottom line is, what am I sending over to the server? I'm sending over to the server this. I'm making a request. The URL is dictionary, dot, actually dictionary one, dot PHP, question mark, word equals and then whatever I've typed into the text box. Let's see, I've typed in M-U-L in the text box. That's what I'm sending over. Now, based on my discussion at the beginning of class, this better be everything the server needs, right? This better be everything the server needs from the client, because if it isn't, it ain't gonna work, all right? Well, let's think about it. What else would the, the server need? Probably that's all it needs, right? If we were going to extend this and maybe have, instead of just translating in one direction from English to Spanish, but be able to translate between several different languages, we might have to also give the language that the typing was in and the language that we wanted. But for now, this is good enough, all right? The word that we want. All right, so we've made the request. At that point, dictionary one, that PHP gets called, and word in the query string uh, is passed. So um, the, the server-side script can pluck that off the query string and do something with it. Are we okay as of this point, or are there any questions? I've made the request. I made the first request, actually. Let's look at dictionary1.php. All right. First of all, I have an include file, all right? You wouldn't know it because I wasn't on the screen, but I have an include file. That is an include for dictionary.inc. That actually contains my arrays. All right? I've created arrays and I've hard-coded in a bunch of terms. Before you wonder, gee, what is this guy doing typing in all these terms? I actually automated this process. I exported from a website to an Excel worksheet, uh, copied and pasted and wrote a little, wrote a little thingy do in Excel just to go and generate this code. So this code is generated by Excel based on some values that I plucked from a website. And you can tell that by a couple reasons. There's no way I'm going to type 829 lines. So you know that it had to come across a different way. Uh, yeah, exactly. I am. I'm, uh, I'm dedicated to finding a way that I don't have to type 829 lines. All right. So anyhow, this obviously is going to be shared by both pieces, right? It's going to be shared by both pieces. It's going to be shared by... First of all, the code is going to look for what words match the string in the English array. And then the Spanish array is going to be used when I pick the term that I want to translate to give me the Spanish translation. 
now. Okay? So that's what that does. That's the array. And you'll see that in my other script as well. Dollar sign word equals request word. Well, what's request word? That's what I'm passing. That's what I'm passing on the request. So I, I got to grab it off there and use it. So I do that. Now, this code might look tricky at first, but it's actually not that tricky. All right? Um, I could I could have cleaned up this code a little bit, but I'm setting be none to true. All right, and keep in mind just for ease in conversation, I'm not going to say dollar sign be none. I'm just going to say be none, and you know that there needs to be a dollar sign in front of it. So I'm going to assume there aren't any words that match until I find one. Again, it's just easier to code that way. I then loop through all the elements in that A English array. I equals zero. I is less than the count of A English. And I'm incrementing I by one each time through. So that's the classic for loop to loop through the entire contents of an array. You'll see that in, in just about every language. The only difference is, you know, like how you determine the, the number of elements in the array. In PHP, it's count, and then you give it the array. I then look to see if I can find that word anywhere in that array element. And I'm calling this strpos function. Let's Google this guy. like these arguments, right? The one argument is called haystack, the other argument is called needle. What does this return? This returns an integer indicating the first occurrence of that substring in the string. So, in other words, if I did this, If my if I did this function strpos Mike comma M it's going to return a position of zero because again we start counting with zero so the M is in the zeroth position. If I did strpos of Mike and I looked for mi, it'll also return zero because the mi starts in position zero. If I did strpos of Mike and I looked for Ike, it's going to give me a value of 1, because that's where it finds that. Now, in the case of our lookup, all right, we're not interested if the string is anywhere in it. We're interested if the string starts with the, the, the values that we've typed in. So in other words, if I type an M in, I don't want to see every word that contains an M. I want to see every word that starts with an M. All right, look the difference. In a, go ahead. So it will be the string position of zero, all right, that I'm going to be looking for. All right. 
So, if it's one, you know, if there's an M somewhere else in it, I'm not concerned about it, so I don't want to return it. Now, there's one catch. The return value. PHP being a funky language that isn't big on data types, thinks it's okay to sometimes return an integer, sometimes return a Boolean. Yeah, what the heck? Yeah, we'll return an integer, I'll return a Boolean, I don't care. You know, that's what PHP says. I'm personifying PHP. You can blame Mr. Gresh for that. Mr. Gresh always gave the computer a voice and the computer said, you know, you'd say, hey computer, What's one plus one? And the computer says, one plus one, the, computer, the answer is two. So again, that's how I'm getting that. So that string position is going to return a false if it's not in there at all. OK? So what does that mean? That means, yeah, if I, if I do a search in Mike and I look for, A Z, that's going to return a value of false. All right? Now, there's a warning on here that's a little cryptic, but the key to understanding it is to understand that PHP is, isn't big on data types. And what this says is this function may return Boolean false, but it may also return a non Boolean value which evaluates the false, such as zero or an empty string. Ooh, so it might return a zero or it might return a false. And if I test if it's equal to false, it's gonna, if it starts with it and the return value is zero, it's gonna think it's not in there at all. Ooh, that's weird. The bottom line is there's a special <laughs> three equal sign comparison that will evaluate it as a Boolean. So, equal and identical are actually two different comparisons. So, two equal signs is used to equal after what they whimsically call type juggling. In other words, one takes a guess of converting the types between these. So, if I did an equal, if I did two equals there, it's going to convert false to a zero and it's going to give me a misleading result. Three equal signs indicates that it's identical, which means it has the same value and there's no type juggling, it's the same type. So, what do we learn from this? We learn the function is going to return one of three possibilities. All right? It's going to return a false. If it returns a false, then that string isn't anywhere in the substring isn't anywhere in the big string. So that's a return of false. It could return a zero. That means that the substring is at the start of the string. That's the one we want, right? Or it could return a number that is not zero. Like it could return a two or a five or, or whatever. We don't want those either. All right? So we don't want the false returns. We don't want the non-zero returns. The only thing we want is where it returns a zero. I probably could simplify this code a little bit. Um, after I get this to work, uh, after I run through this, I'm going I'm to try revising this to be a little bit simpler. All right. But as you see here, what it's doing is, is grabbing the position, if that evaluates the false, I don't do anything. If it doesn't evaluate the false, I look to see if the value is equal to zero. If it equals to zero, I have a winner, and I output the value of that element in the array, and I output the value of i. All right? And I output the value of i.
Actually, I'm going to make a note to simplify this function. Because I think I can simplify this code. Which is proof that you do get wider as you get older. Because when I wrote this, I don't know, I wrote this maybe a couple years back. Um, I thought that was the way I had to do it, but now I'm thinking about it, I, I see a cleaner way to do it. But anyhow, I digress. So, the bottom line is what it's outputting is it's outputting delimited data, a word, a semicolon, then a value of an index. What do you suppose I need that index for? Uh, pardon me? Okay. Um, you're on the right track. I, explain to me a little bit how that's going to work. Okay. In other words, wh what he's saying is this. Um, if we look at this, these arrays, if I picked, let's keep it simple and we'll pick the first one. If I picked absolute value, that is an index of zero in the English array. What do you suppose in the Spanish array has an index of zero? Absolute value. So, yeah. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence to that. So if I know the index of the English term, I know the index of the Spanish term. So I'm going to keep that index because I'm going to make my drop-down. And what do you suppose I'm going to make the value of the drop-down? The value of the index. So then that's available to send to the server all right, so that I can grab the corresponding Spanish translation and send it back. All right. So that's what I'm going to do. If we want to see the output of this, I'm going to run the server side script just from the address prompt and, and, and see what we get. Question mark word equals A, let's say. That's what I get. I get delimited data, all right, whereas each word is separated by a colon and each part of that entry for the word, there's a part that is the, the English word, and then there's a part of my array index so that I can use that to look up the Spanish. So word, semicolon, index value. Next word, semicolon, next index value, and so on down the line. Again, remember I suggested that it's a good idea to test your server-side code like this. You know, you have in your mind what it is you want to return, Make sure your server-side code is returning that. Don't assume it is just because you wrote it. All right. Um, again, actually test it. So that's what I'm returning. All right. So the PHP code again is returning this by looping through, by grabbing the word, looping through all the array elements, determining is that field somewhere is the field that we enter in somewhere in our term. Is it at the beginning? And if it's at the beginning, I output it. I also set B none to false. Because if I make it all the way through and I don't find any, I set, uh, I set, uh, uh, I, I send a different thing back to this uh, client. No words match this pattern. So if I were to just type garbage in here, I get no words match this pattern. And if I try to select that, I get back, select a valid word. All right. So we're up to sending this data back to the client. Now, what's the client going to do? Well, you can guess the client's going to split this data a couple times, right? 
going to split it using a colon to get a list of all the words associated with uh, that string. It's then going to split each of those entries by the semicolon so it has the word and it has the index. So let's look at that. Again, create DD was my callback function. If the ready state is 4, in other words, if it's all done, grab the response from HTTP response text. So it's grabbing that string. DD options length equals 0. What do you think that's doing? I'm zeroing out my drop downs. Because I say DD equals document form math DD words. So my variable DD equals this drop down. So what I'm doing is I'm zeroing out the options. So if there's options there before, right? So like if I typed in an A, if there's options there before, I don't add to it each time, right? Because otherwise, every time I typed in a new character, it would duplicate some of the options. So I clear it out because each time I want to start fresh. So that's what this does. All right. I'm splitting this by the colon. So I will have each one of these in an array element. That would be A English 0. This would be A English 1 and so on. I then split it again based on the semicolon. So I have in A option, A option sub 0 will have this guy. A option sub 1 will have this guy. Then I create an option. DD options equals new option. And A option sub 0 is the description, which is the word. A option 1 is the value of that option, which will be the index. All right? So this is a little bit different syntax than we've seen before. We've typically created HTML on our page by just doing a, 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 an inner HTML equals some giant string that we have constructed. And we could do that here too. All right? But this is probably a, a smarter way to do it. Because we're actually using the DOM, the document object model, to create it. New option says, hey, I'm going to make a new option tag. All right? That's going to consist of that description and that value. This goes and adds that new option to the end of our dropdown. So first time through, this option is going to be 0. So it will make it the first option. Second time through will be 1 and so on. So, the bottom line is when we're done, what I type in here gives me back those um, options. All right? So, there was four things returned back, four options are created in my drop down. Unfortunately, I can't do a view source and see that, right? Because it's JavaScript that wrote those. But trust me, there's four options in this drop-down. The description that you see is there. The value represents the index of that. Now, if I can just go over time for a minute or two to wrap this one up. The last part of it is easy. All right? When I've selected the one that I want and click the button, what happens? What do you think happens? What do you think happens? Someone describe to me the code on the client and the code on the server. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. And return that. OK. And then it's going to return one name. That name just gets popped in the inner HTML just like we've been doing all along. So to review, the way this works is when I click that button, 
It's going to make a request to a different script, all right, to dictionary two. It's going to grab the value of that dropdown, put it on the query string, call dictionary two. Dictionary two, what's it going to do? It's going to grab that index off and print out the element in the Spanish array that matches that index. So that'll be sent back to the client. The client then was going to pluck it out of the response text and just pop it somewhere on the page. And sure enough, if we look at this, that's what we will see. On click on this button, I have get translation. Get translation. All right, little little more involved than that because I'm doing a validation. I'm testing to see that the, that there's a valid um, item chosen. Because remember, I used a, an index of a negative one to indicate that um, that that there was that there were no words that matched that string. So I check that first. But if it's not equal to negative one, I do exactly that. I create my request to dictionary two. I pass on this query, query string index, index being the value of that element on the dropdown. All right, which again I sort of use a, a, a long way to do it. You could probably write that code a little bit differently and get the same result. The bottom line is I'm getting the selected value from the dropdown and I'm formatting the request to add that on. My server side code then is real simple. I include my array. I grab the index off of that. I print the Spanish translation. And last but not least, my display translation, which is a callback function here, is also real easy. All right. I grab, uh, I point to that uh, element on the page, set its enter HTML equal to the response text. I don't need to split that response text at all. All right. Why? Because I'm only sending back one thing. If I were to look on the server for this, my response is going to look something like this. In, um, if I type in dictionary to PHP index equals 12, for example, that's all it returns, just one word. So no need to split it, no need to do any special formatting. I could just pop it on the page. All right. I would imagine the tricky parts to this one. Um, are this. Making the request probably, first of all, let's back up for a second. That whole second Ajax request is pretty much a piece of cake. All right. In fact, we're not even going to, you know, I'll answer any questions if you have about it, but we're not going to review that as we review the other versions of this. Because that stays the same, it's pretty simple, nothing to get excited about. The parts that I think are challenging Making a request, the initial request, based on what you've typed in the text box, isn't that earth shattering. I think that's pretty straightforward. And that is going to stay the same across all our iterations of this. The XML version, the, the JSON version, uh, it's going to be the same. All right, because I'm making the request the same way. Now, what is probably challenging about this, and what we'll spend some time looking at, is number one, the PHP script that processes that string and produces the output. So that we're using a bunch of new functions. We're using goofy triple equal signs and we're using a uh, string position function and we're going to be outputting JSON and outputting XML. That gets a little messy. So we'll look at that and we'll spend some detail on that. The other thing that um, is a little confusing is the parsing of the data that we're going to get back from the server and creating the drop down. So I could see why this example today, I would think those two areas might be the areas that you might have some question about still. Um, spend some time to look at this. Uh, you can look at uh, the, the JSON and XML version if you wish. Um, I will post sometime between now and Monday an updated version of this, maybe to clean up the server side scripting a little bit. Because I think I can I think I can clean it up a little bit and make it maybe a little more straightforward, a little, little more easy to understand. All right? But that's what we'll be doing. We have four more classes left. All right? And that's what we will at least be doing for some of them. All right? Um, I'm not sure what we'll do after that. We'll, we'll just see how it goes, and we'll see, you know, uh, what 
trouble you're running into in labs and, and so on. All right, questions? All right, see you in lab. <laughs>